I sit on the board of Twitter. And I think Jack and the team would say themselves that if there had been more men, women in the room, they might have had a different conversation from the outset at Twitter, doing a huge amount now around abuse and security. But when you have a bunch of young white men who've never walked down a street feeling vulnerable, as every single woman in the world has done, of course you don't think about people shouting at you, perhaps behaving nastily, because you haven't necessarily experienced that in your own life. Where exactly is all this privilege she's talking about? I'm a white male, and I've walked down the street many times feeling unsafe. Surely it can't only be women who feel unsafe. In fact, thanks to all these woke policies that people like her promote, my area is way more dangerous and I no longer feel safe going to the store after dark because of all the homeless people that have flooded my community over the past few years. And this was previously a good area. For those of you who don't know, this is Martha Lane Fox, a member of the board of directors on Twitter. Actually, is it more appropriate to say former board of directors? I'm not really sure. We'll see how this video ages. But in light of all the drama going on with Elon Musk and Twitter right now, I have never really seen someone go into depth on any of the people who run this big tech website outside of the Joe Rogan interview with Tim Pool. Now, it's one thing to have some sort of idea of what the people who make these policy decisions for Twitter are like, but it's completely different to do a deep dive and see just how racist and sexist a person like Martha Lane Fox is firsthand. For example, As a woman, a woman in the technology sector, I feel so deeply passionately that we have not even begun to put the right voices in the room. It is astonishing that 96% of the world's software is built by men. The right voices aren't in the room. 96% of the voices are men. Therefore, men are the wrong voices. Does nobody pick up on how that statement was sexist? Outside of basic demographics, what proof do you have that men making up most of the software developers is harmful to the tech industry? What proof do you have that adding more women to the tech industry will solve whatever this problem is that you have not really described? The answer is none, because she provides no source citations for any of her major claims. And we know that companies that have a founding team with women in it, either two women and a man or a man and a woman, do better in profit terms. Everyone benefits. I'm not saying you're wrong, but you need to tell people how you came to that conclusion. Otherwise, people have no way of verifying the validity of what you're saying. And I don't believe that she simply forgot to name the source, because she doesn't cite her sources a bunch of times during the speeches that I watched. She did it with the demographics, too. Who determined that 96% of software developers are male? How do I know that's right? I'm also skeptical that she doesn't know that you're supposed to cite your sources, because she has a master's degree from a satellite school of Oxford. Research is a part of getting a degree, and in college, they will fail you if you don't cite your sources. Why? Because not telling people the source of your information in the professional field is considered to be dishonest. Yet all these college-educated people who go on TV or do scripted speeches seem to forget to tell people where they got their information. This happens so often that I've gotten to the point where I'm tired of giving these people the benefit of the doubt, especially the people who have run Twitter for the better part of the past decade. And I think we have taken that a, a strong position here, partly because it's very core to the mission of what Twitter is doing. Um, we've always held... Uh, political speech to be uh, very dear to the platform. One of the most important functions that we provide uh, as a service around the world is this ability to speak freely. Yeah, right. This speech was done in 2017. By this time, Vidya and her team had already been one-sidedly censoring people. Twitter has also done lots of immoral stuff. Oh, and here's MSNBC blatantly trying to cover it up. And as we discussed in one of our special reports just last week, if you own all of Twitter or Facebook or what have you, you don't have to explain yourself. You don't even have to be transparent. You could secretly ban one party's candidate or all of its candidates, all of its nominees, or you could just secretly turn down the reach of their stuff and turn up the reach of something else. And the rest of us might not even find out about it till after the election. Oh, you mean like how Twitter hid the Hunter Biden story until after the election was over? That same story that possibly shifted Democrat votes by as much as 5%? Or does that not count because it was all in your favor? Speaking of shadow banning, check out this article here. Twitter's shadow banning bug unfairly filtered 600,000 accounts. Yeah, I don't believe that was a bug. This tweet from Jack said that some of the accounts were members of Congress. Gee, I wonder what their political party was. And if you still don't believe that the people who run Twitter have been predatory towards people who go against their political ideas, tons of anti-establishment accounts recently since Elon purchased the platform all of a sudden have been gaining an insane number of followers. Since Tuesday, I have gained 100,000 followers, which is around 
of my follower count. 10%. Strange, because I noticed a lot of other people have a similar number of around 8 to 10%. The weird thing is that it starts on Tuesday. On Monday, when the news broke, hmm, nothing. He's not lying. Look at the social blade data from the time it happened. In less than three days, he gained 100k subs, which is a nearly 10% increase in his following. That's insane growth. And as far as I can see, he tweeted like he normally does with no viral content. Conveniently, this happened the day after the deal was made for Elon to purchase Twitter, instead of the day of, which is making people think that Twitter employees are rushing to delete shadow banning algorithms so they don't get into trouble. And there's also this article here that says that Twitter has been falsifying its daily user numbers, which is fraud, because advertisers make payments based on Twitter's audience reach. Let's point out the fact that Twitter, which has decided that they would take it upon themselves to determine what was or was not misinformation in the outside world, would not even deliver accurate figures on how their website was doing. I, I'll tell you, man, I work behind the scenes at Minds developing that company for a decade, and there is no way that they did not know that one person with five accounts is not one person. They, they, they're intentionally allowing that to play for, for, to overvalue the company. This is insidious. So really, in an attempt to attack Elon Musk, that MSNBC clip just described a bunch of things that Twitter already does. But the problem is that there are still a large group of people who cannot tell when they're being lied to or being manipulated. And how are they supposed to know? Good manipulators always try to convince you that they are the good guy. Getting back to Martha Lane Fox, the theme of one of her speeches was about how to use the internet to improve people's lives. Look at what she says here. Who would think this is nefarious? One young man that I met when I visited a crisis center in a very poor area of Leeds, he looked at me and he said, the internet saved my life. I thought, no, that, how can that really be true? Surely it was other factors. But then he described to me how he'd been found in a bus shelter, terrible drug problems, been taken to help get through them, and then encouraged to go and learn something that he could use to build his life again. And what he'd chosen was music, and the tools that they had given him were building music online, doing DJing online. He had therefore learnt a new skill, decided he was going to become a DJ, use this music to spread his exciting ideas online, get small amounts of payment for it. But importantly, he got some dignity and respect back just from that small engagement with using the internet. That's awesome, and that's what I love about the internet. The internet is a universal education tool that everyone in first world countries has access to, and now it's moving into the third world. No longer are people restricted from having access to knowledge because they were born poor, and no longer are people prevented from having access to knowledgeable people simply because they live in the wrong area. Everyone now has the ability to learn essentially whatever skill they want, often from the best teachers in the world. So Martha says something that pretty much everyone can agree with and uses that to rope you into her cause. Once she has you hooked, she can then say incredibly messed up stuff like this. And then, for an absolutely remarkable woman called Dame Stephanie Shirley, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who started a company in the late 1960s, she thought that she could kind of blow apart the models of working because of this amazing new technology. She wanted to employ only women working from home, building software. Did you not just say that it's problematic for the vast majority of a space to be male? So how is having an all-female staff a cure? I thought you were for diversity and inclusion thinking that they really fall at the minute to me into three sort of buckets. And the first one is around diversity and um, inclusion. An all-female company doesn't sound very diverse or inclusive. And earlier, did she not tout the importance of having a mixed team of founders that includes women and men? I have to see who this audience is made of because I'd be shocked if none of them thought it was extremely sexist when she said that. Because basically at every point in this speech, she is insinuating that women are better than men in every way. I don't think she says one good thing about men in this particular speech or any of the others I saw outside of the story that she told about that DJ, but that was more about the benefits of the internet, not about the guy. Then, after talking about her all-female company, she follows it up with this. Now, doesn't that blow apart quite a lot of stereotypes that we hear about now? Stevie's funny because she says that the thing that really screwed her company up was the Equal Pay Act and the Equalities Act, which was obviously brilliant for women in the round, but meant that she had to start employing men. <laughs> if there are any feminists watching, this is why people say that you guys aren't actually fighting for equality. That chick was mad that she had to adopt a non-sexist hiring policy when her goal was to fight sexism. Personally, I think the government should stay out of it and people should be able to hire whoever they want. 
but can you see her and Martha actively going against the principles they are fighting for the minute it doesn't directly benefit them? That's immoral, and that's one of the primary ways you can tell if someone who is pretending to be good is actually a bad person. Speaking of Vijay Gade, the Twitter lawyer who supposedly cried about Elon taking over the company during a board meeting, remember when she said this on the Joe Rogan experience? So, so I, I guess I'm trying to say is, at what po- would you guys restrict someone from sharing inf- like false information about vaccines that could get someone hurt? That is not a violation of Twitter's rules. No. Obviously, that's not the case because Twitter won't even allow medical professionals who develop vaccines to say anything contrary to the mainstream narrative. Tim did an excellent job in this podcast pointing out the ridiculous number of inconsistencies in the way Twitter enforces its policies. Take notice of when people set moral standards and see if they actually follow them. Understandably, once in a while, everyone will make a mistake and go against their values on accident. That's acceptable. But if you are just blatantly stepping on all your values constantly, then you aren't here to help people, you're here to manipulate them. Here's another example of Martha going against her principles. There are loads and loads of fabulous things happening in this country. There are people like Sue Black running Tech Mums, teaching women in Tower Hamlets how to get digital skills and then they go on to be entrepreneurs. People like Emma Mulqueeny with Reward State and Young Reward State, helping young people get coding skills. And she has seen a big increase in the number of girls going into her program. People like Anne-Marie and Rapidian with STEMETs. People like uh, all of the Digital Mums coding teams. There are lots and lots of things happening. Wait, didn't a lot of people get banned on Twitter for telling female writers at BuzzFeed to learn to code when they got laid off? Seeing that Martha complained that 96% of coders are male, you would think that as a woman who is on the board of Twitter and wants more women to go into software, she would be delighted by this meme. It sounds to me like she doesn't actually care about women in the technology sector and is just using this as a grift to sell some sort of idea that people otherwise would not want. More on that in a minute, but first, one more way to identify these grifters. As I said earlier, they will never, or almost never, say anything good about their opponents. How you treat your opponents in a public space is crucial, because if you treat them like crap, you'll poison the well and make society worse, no matter how correct your ideas are. Now on this channel, I cover some pretty reprehensible people, but I still regularly make an effort to say good things about them. Not only that, but I also make a point to avoid complimenting people merely because we politically agreed on something, and instead try to make it more about their moral character, some skill they have, or something they've achieved. That being said, obviously I don't like Martha Lane Fox. However, she did start and run a successful internet travel agency, which is insane because statistically, creating a successful business is almost impossible. Almost everyone fails within the first few years. Then, she's even humble a little bit by admitting to this. I had 14 minutes of a man screaming down the phone at me. thinking, what on earth is the problem? But this was because of the unintended consequence of the fast buy button that we had put live on the website. You know the button, we copied it from Amazon, don't tell anyone. You press one button, all the details were the same as the time you'd bought before. I can't knock her for that. I actually stole that very same philosophical principle from Amazon as well. I believe it's called reducing friction, which for me means that I try to make my content as easy to watch as possible. Now I will add one caveat to how you treat your opponents, which is that if you're a comedian, then a lot more stuff like name calling is fair game. Good comedians are here to make fun of everyone, so they get a pass on things like that, whereas in conversation or debate, name-calling an opponent is unacceptable. Anyway, back to what I was saying before about people like Martha pretending to care about equality to sell you something that you otherwise would not want. Let's go back to that all-female company she mentioned. She wanted to employ only women working from home building software, and she wanted to do it using uh, government contracts, so no kind of fluffy software development for her. She wanted the women in her workforce to be building the Polaris submarine, the black box for Concord. You see what she did there? The real work is with the government. Forget the private sector that, by the way, consisted of the people who invented submarines and airplanes. And what did these women work on? Well, that Polaris submarine was a weapon of war built to fire nukes. So Martha Lane Fox, a member of the board of directors of Twitter, said that working on government weapons is the thing to strive towards. In fact, this is not the only time in the speech that she glorifies war. And Herodotus had written about the peoples of the Altai Mountains, the backdrop to where we were, and how they had this incredible army of women. Women who were so brilliant at their jobs that some of them would cut their breasts off so that they could fire bows and arrows from horseback. Great, they mutilated their bodies so they could fight in wars. How is that empowering to women? War is not glorious, it's bloody, it's traumatic, 
and it seems to me that most of the time, war is started because some elite asshole who doesn't have to do any of the fighting and dying wants to forcibly take another group's resources instead of negotiating for those resources through trade. I think what these ancient women did to themselves should be seen as an unfortunate consequence of their time, not something to strive towards. Speaking of stealing resources... When I started my business with Brent Hoberman in 1998, lastminute.com, it felt as though the internet and the digital world was going to be so exciting. There was going to be opportunity for people that looked like me. There were going to be new voices from all over the world. There was going to be redistributed wealth, disruption of power, all kinds of exciting things were going to happen. Oh, you mean theft? Because that's what these people mean when they say wealth redistribution. Let's take money from this group and give it to that group. Unless they willingly give you the money, that's stealing. And disruption of power? Judging by how many establishment sources supported the 2020 riots, that's what they mean by disruption of power. I don't think at all they mean the little guy is going to compete with the big guy when they say wealth redistribution, and I don't think they mean grassroots movements are going to replace all the fake astroturf ones when they say disruption of power. Because when Elon made the offer to buy Twitter and said that all he wanted was to make it a fair playing field, they all lost their minds. Martha also promotes this. At Dot Everyone, we've been working on something we call the Responsible Technology Toolkit. And the idea is sort of micro credits so that you'll be able to assess how good companies were across a whole band of different things around responsibility. It could be, are their teams diverse? It could be use of data. It could be how they design things. Gee, that sounds a lot like an environmental and social governance score. You know, those scores that banks are slowly starting to use to bully corporations into leftist and woke positions by refusing to give out loans or upping their interest rates. Do you see how these people always decorate horrible things with a nice name? Like George Bush and the Patriot Act. Sounds inspirational, right? What did that legislation do? It allowed the government to violate the Fourth Amendment and illegally spy on everyone all the time. What about Obama's Affordable Care Act that doubled or tripled the cost of people's health care and gave you a yearly fine if you didn't want to give money to the health insurance companies who are a part of the reason why America's healthcare is so ridiculously overpriced. You can't focus on the name. You have to focus on the outcome of the idea. Grow a tree, and by its fruits, you will know what it is. So they can try to sell you on whatever nice-sounding idea that they want, but they won't be able to trick you because by its effects, you will know what it is. That being said, here's the narrative that I think they're trying to sell in the disguise of calling it female empowerment. Surely we have the opportunity to say, you know what, we're going to be the most incredible place to be a woman in technology in the world. And that is going to create a kind of a live testbed for other people and a place where we design absolutely rock and roll, awesome products and services because we are engaging half the workforce. Yeah, but in this case, if both parents are working, then who is taking care of the kids? Do you think it's right to rob kids of time with their parents as if this were some sort of dystopian novel like Brave New World? It was a brave new world. Is it that brave new world? This is why I think mainstream activist feminists and mainstream media are incredibly misogynistic because for years they've been telling women that their traditional role is useless. Kind of like how all the college intellectuals crap on the blue-collar workers who grow the food, generate the electricity, and build the air-conditioned offices that those intellectuals work in. Traditionally, women were responsible for the important jobs at home, like making sure the kids ate home-cooked meals instead of unhealthy fast food. They were responsible for making sure that kids socialized properly with other kids so they don't grow up to be sociopaths or abusers. And they were responsible for keeping the home environment clean and nice looking. These are all things that lead to good mental health in a society. That is incredibly important work because mental health is everything. It doesn't matter what politics you have. If your mental health is bad, then in the end, you'll always make the wrong choice. Society thrives on good mental health and decays on poor mental health. And don't tell me this is all about fighting for equality. This is about removing children from their parents. Look at the promotion. If they cared about children, equality would be TV ads of women in the workplace, followed by promotion of stay-at-home dads, which I would be fine with. Personally, I don't care who stays home as long as one parent stays home for the mental well-being of the kids. But you don't see that. All of the promotion has been geared towards getting both parents out of the home and using government schools like daycare, the same government schools that have just become propaganda centers full of discriminatory ideology that they call diversity, inclusion, and equity, instead of teaching kids useful skills. Not to mention how feminists and the modern left seem to constantly crap on women who very much want to be stay-at-home moms instead of working a job. But I can't help but notice that everything the establishment does just harms people's mental health. 
That's what I think this is all about, and they are so obvious about this that they literally have tons of people repeating the same type of script. Listen to this. So we have a huge power structure problem in diversity, and as a woman who's always worked in technology, I find this absolutely astonishing because it didn't seem it was going to be like that. It felt as though this was going to be a world that could be opened up and could be uh, distributed and fragmented in a way that I didn't imagine would be um, anything other than exciting. Does that line of thought sound familiar to you? If you watched my video on Lily Singh, you might have noticed that she used very similar wording to grift about YouTube. I remember wanting to start a critical conversation because I saw this article and I was heartbroken. You know, the digital space had always been a place that I thought was without gatekeepers, and here it was looking just like old Hollywood. I thought things were finally going to be fair in this new world, but let me tell you how I still found a way to call it misogynistic by using plain demographics and not actual examples of misogyny. That's essentially what both of them said. This is like Anita Sarkeesian levels of grift. And gee, weird, it's almost like some sort of think tank thought of this concept and big public figures are being told to say it like they got caught doing with Greta Thunberg. Do you remember that? At Dot Everyone, the think tank and charity that I founded, we talk a lot about coping, not coding. Seeing all their actions, do you really think these people are looking out for what's best for you? Martha Lane Fox works for a company that will ban people for a meme about learning how to code, but is perfectly fine with allowing terrorist groups like Antifa to organize on their website. Thank God someone like Elon just took their social power away from them. I do want to be cautious when I say this stuff, though, because I'm at the point where I only believe things regarding big tech when I see it. But hopefully, the end result of this purchase is that Twitter slowly moves towards free speech and allows more than one political and philosophical perspective. The rest of this gets resolved on a personal level. I say this a lot on my channel, but you have to get good at identifying abusers. Abusers will ruin years of your life, they'll get you to believe messed up things, and they'll make you feel worthless. Because of my channel's success, I've talked to a lot of amazing people who think they are trash because of the things that abusers have done to them in the past. Stop letting these people have influence over you. Now, I've always tried to make a point on this channel to try and figure out the most important things to focus on to achieve the goals you want. This is it. This is what fixes the corruption. Learn how to identify abusers, don't engage with them, and fix your mental health. You cannot have a good system without good mental health, because without good mental health, some crazy person will always try to sabotage things. The more mentally healthy people are, the less things like that will happen. So if we create a society that caters more towards mental health, all the horrific stuff we see happening will begin to stop. Anyway, thanks for watching, follow me on Twitter, and I'll see you in the next video.